Hi, this is Privateer Station, and today we're bringing you day 230 as Alexei Aristovich, advisor to the office of the president of Ukraine, and Mark Fagan, Russian opposition journalist, discuss the aftermath of Putin's criminal attacks on Ukraine cities with remainder of his missiles. Enjoy. Dear friends, glad to see you all. It's Tuesday, October 11th. Time is uh, 15 minutes past 10. I apologize for this delay. Alexei was a bit late today, that happens, but we still are glad to see you here, despite me being late. Well, I understand, it's work, it's work. It's uh, day 230 and we are doing another stream. We have over 180,000 watching us live, over 5,000 click the like button. I have the usual ask, please share this stream in your social media. Do not forget to click the like button, only about 20% of you do click that, so please uh, do not forget. Yesterday we had a record amount of viewers, 630,000 watched us live, I don't know if we shall repeat that uh, record, but it is important for us for that stream to be shared as much as wide as possible. And uh, do not forget to subscribe to Fagin Live, to Alexei Rostovich, and of course to the Privateer Station if you are listening to that or watching that in English. All right, let's start with the uh, discussion. In the last 24 hours, uh, let's talk about what's going on in the fronts. Do you want to start with the fronts or with the shellings? Uh, both. Okay. So they launched 28 missiles. 16x555 or ha555. It's about two and a half times uh, fewer than yesterday. 12 calibers. 18 of them were shot down. We also shot down eight Kamikaze UAVs and three UAVs that were observing. Overall, we shot down over 60% of uh, what entered our airspace. That shows again that uh, we are rather effective when our airspace is not oversaturated with targets. And uh, overall, this is a still difficult uh, situation to handle. And I cannot exclude another two to three airstrikes like that until they run out of missiles. What's going on the fronts? Um, somewhat of a pause full of tension. Now both sides do not have enough power to show a brilliant counteroffensive, neither us nor them, but uh, both sides are fighting for small tactical advantages locally, and uh, Putin's troops are even trying to do minor counterattacks on the tactical level near Slatova and uh, fighting for better positions, better positions to hold the area and uh, better positions to accumulate resources before uh, continuing the offensive or counteroffensive. So it depends who gets there first with resources. Uh, I sincerely suspect they will not be able to. Uh, Bakhmut, uh, they are still trying, they are still pushing. Those who joined Wagner company are dying in that part of the front. Our guys are holding, it's a difficult situation there, again, mostly due to over-concentration of uh, Russian artillery in that direction, but that will not continue for too long. We will pay attention to this part of the front and everything will be all right. Donetsk and Marienka, similar story. Um, weak attempts to attack our front lines uh, with uh, some random use of artillery and aviation. Zaporozhye is a rather stable front line with minor tactical moves. They keep shelling the Parozhi region, 12 uh, S-300 missiles, each of them carries about 150 kilos, about 300 pounds of uh, explosives, uh, they're flying via short trajectory, very fast, even the early warning system usually doesn't have enough time to let people evacuate and hide, and we've seen some aftermath, we've seen some 
civilian multi-story buildings destroyed, missing pieces, and I forgot the exact number, so I probably should not um, say how many people dead and wounded. I remember that I remember wounded. I am not sure how many died. Um, Kherson region, we're still targeting the remainder of their group there. We have a really full bank of targets. We don't even have enough time to shoot them all. They're more concentrated. Territory is uh, smaller. So almost every shell hits the target. On the ground, the situation is similar. Both sides are struggling for smaller tactical positions. So we're not talking about break, breakthroughs of 10, 15 kilometers, but, you know, local fights for certain intersections, certain hill, to be able to control the area and await reinforcement. There was no ground motion that we could, could have told them that, hey, um, uh, we captured more. That wasn't happening, but we are taking out the targets. And we also hit a few targets near Melitopol. Um, they've been reporting dozens perished. And generally, in a day, we take out about one battalion tactical group. So overall, they have 130 of these groups, and we take one per day. So in 130 days, the whole army has a good chance of uh, running out of resources again. And they are trying to rotate to refill the missing personnel, but uh, their tempo is much slower than our tempo of taking them out. So if that trend continues by February, March, they'll be barren again without troops. And by the way, speaking of mobilized, the Mobix, the new guys that showed up on the front, we even start to see them in Kherson area. And um, yeah, we've seen some of the interviews on Zolkin's uh, channel. He posts those interviews with uh, captured uh, Putin's fighters. And um, I don't know if you've seen the video, but um, yeah, this is the guy is totally overwhelmed. I've seen that, but this is a degree of human tragedy. You've been uh, mobilized, you've been thrown to the front, went through the grinder, somehow managed to stay alive. You're sitting trying to answer questions. Um, the guy is uh, really lucky, though, because many of his uh, buddies who were with him, they didn't even have time to understand what's going on, and now they're either dead or maimed. There are quite a lot of them on Kherson area now. Um, they're getting them through the ferries, through the transport lines. Um, not all of them get through because we are still effective on the ferries uh, with our artillery. And uh, a bunch of them dies real fast in uh, small skirmishes along the front line. And of course, a death of one man is a tragedy, tragedy, even if it's an enemy. Yeah, a death of thousands is, of course, yes, statistics. For me, even the death of my foe is tragedy. Well, you know, Alexei, everybody chooses his own destiny in this case. Um, true, true, I'm not sentimental. The fact that I'm feeling tragedy doesn't mean that my hand will fray. But I still understand these people, and as a professional military, I understand that you have two components to your value. You have your ethics and values, and you have your skills. It, um, if you have the right values, it helps to survive, it helps to stay psychologically sound. If you are lacking both, it's real fast to go into the ground. The record actually for now is about four days near Svatova. The guy was uh, mobilized and in four days he was captured. Before that I think it was five. So now it's uh, the same thing with uh, perished as well. In four days after conscription they go to the front and die.
or at best get captured. I remember back in May, June, when they used a lot of uh, hidden mobilization techniques to bring more people to the front. And they went through the two week preparations before coming here. By the way, bars were, they were uh, volunteers. Yeah, and they had two kinds of contracts. They had three week or six, uh, three month or six months contracts. And many of them came to the front, hopeful, singing music, hoping to find fascists uh, that Putin is talking to that, telling them about through their TVs. A week after their arrival, 20% of them were killed, 30% were wounded. So each detachment lost about 50% in a week. And very often many of them had no time to even realize what's going on. The world was breaking apart and they were falling into sort of catalepsy and uh, they were just, when, when captured, they were basically sitting and looking into a single point and barely answering questions. It's uh, pretty hard on the human psyche when things happen in such a whirlwind manner. In uh, Russia, they started getting notes of uh, death of mobilized. These are single ones, uh, basically wherever they finally sent, because, you know, Russian Minister of Defense, they can keep mom for a while. And there is an example when one guy stopped answering and people stormed the recruitment office and finally got the data. So for now, it's just single events, but uh, it's still impressive. Oh, Mark, they're not single events. It's just they, they're not reporting that. We already have dozens and dozens. The nature of fighting is so difficult that uh, they probably would not even bother with transporting bodies. Uh, in Kherson region, they barely transport enough ammo. They would not care about uh, transporting bodies. They do care about ammo, food, and supplies. Wounded later, if they still have them, and dead, uh, not even an, uh, not even on the list. And they already have 2,500 dead, almost 3,000 in the last uh, couple of weeks. Um, how much can they send there? Well, here's the problem of your son, because you can send as many as you want, but you need to outfit them with ammo, you need to feed them. They are barely feeding 20-30% of what they have, what they need to. It's it's remaining reminding me of the Paulus army in Russia in the Second World War. Imagine you have uh, two cans of food for 10 people, and now you have uh, doubled your number and now you have the same amount of food for double the amount of people. So that's Kherson. Uh, every new people arriving in, in a way make your situation more dire. And I need to distract our viewers. I'm showing the picture. Igor Chebatarev, uh, supposedly from Moscow, he actually told Zolkin that he subscribed to him. He's seen a lot of his videos and he's a fan. So he met uh, with his with the owner of that channel. Um, if, if anybody knows Yegor Chibatarev, anybody from Moscow who worked or knew him, of course, nothing will happen to him now. It's good. He is captured and uh, he'll await the exchange. But uh, just in case, you know, we can maybe trace the destiny of a person. He was probably doing something in Moscow, some kind of business. Looks like he could have been an IT dude, but then Putin, for his own gratification of his imperial ambitions, grabbed the guy and threw him to the front. From central streets of Moscow to the place of death, where he was for a few days and uh, was lucky enough to be captured. This story is interesting for us, so if you have more details, please uh, help us. And those people who are not mobilized, uh, watch that, because that's an interesting story for you. That's your uh, happy chance uh, in the future, if that happens to you. In your estimations or Ukraine military data, if you have any numbers, how many of them are on the south or on the east? Is it thousands or tens of thousands? I think about 10,000 at least uh, on the territory of Ukraine. Interesting.
Just want to understand what about the rest? They are rotating, they are fitting the detachments. They withdrew some troops to Belgrade district to refit and add more personnel, more troops. Overall, there's probably a group of 20,000 that is uh, being matched there, and then they'll likely bring it back. Oh, let's speak about Belarus now. Lukashenko is making statements that he is not going to invade Ukraine. Now he is uh, waving his schlong in a different direction. Before that, he was waving it towards Ukraine and uh, saying that Ukraine is threatening sovereignty of Belarus. And his earlier statements were in favor of Putin. These days he is making another statement to calm down the West, I guess. How is the situation changing there? Did anything change? Mark, it's not really developing. It's Lukashenko using Alexander Grigorievich using the same formula. He says something horrible, everybody faints, and the next day he battles back and says something friendly and supportive of uh, Zelensky and uh, his troops and Ukraine. And then the next day he changes everything again. I'm just surprised that he is not talking about China, but maybe he is communicating something to China directly. And he's basically using the same formula. Belarus army is completely not ready to wage any war. Also, they have just sent a ton of ammo to Russia. They're just depleting the reserves they have. On some data, they've shipped over 100,000 uh, munitions, artillery and other. So all this uh, scary dancing with drums uh, and saying that they will go into a scary attack, that's uh, for the birds. And do you think they can send anything over the border? Um, I've heard of one of the concepts when they aggregate 20, 30,000 of mobilized on the border and then just throw them across the border towards Kiev and see what happens. Most likely they will not cross the border, most likely they'll just stay on the border and perhaps shoot uh, something across and do something, you know, to keep us, uh, to keep our attention. But we also realize that Putin is a guy who can give them order to walk to Kiev. That'll be pure insanity and death for them, right? Yeah, because we already fortified our borders and we can withstand, of, uh, we can withstand such an invasion. Um, you know, if they put 15,000 near the border, nobody will be waiting, right? And waiting till they come to the border and cross it. You guys can reach them over in Belarus. Yeah, there is an interesting dissonance here. There is uh, one problem in our collective subconsciousness in Ukraine, that uh, the formula of all Belarusians are assholes has won. Not all of them, right? Yeah, but I'm talking about that mental construct uh, due to some not too bright uh, loud voices that uh, were also supported by some political forces in the country that was very handy for some of them to excite people and all. But uh, at the end we have a very poor attitude towards Belarus people since uh, they're shelling, we're getting shelled from Belarus situation, all Belarus people are assholes. They just refuse to understand that they have uh, a similar gangster regime in that country to the north, which uh, in some ways are even more cruel than Putin, because in Belarus, 100% you will be captured if you say something against Lukashenko, you will either disappear or you will go to jail. Thousands of people went through that. Uh, thousands of broken lives, thousands of uh, harmed people, and uh, giddily jumping on Russian Iskanders and not letting them shoot towards Ukraine, they don't have much options to do that. And uh, even unlike Putin, Putin ruled for what, 20 years now, Lukashenko ruled for almost 30. And it's a different situation. Imagine we had Yanukovych uh, for a couple of years. Now imagine that Yanukovych ruled for 20-something, 20 22 years. 
it would have been much more difficult for us to do Maidan and be heroes. And it would be a big question if we even could have done it. I don't think he would have ruled that long Alexei in Ukraine. Well, for example, for example, Mark. So Belarus people who are fighting on our fronts uh, with us, uh, Kalinovsky detachment, they're showing a lot of courage and professionalism. They're doing real modern day warfare with UAVs, with targeting, with uh, real time hits um, in coordination with artillery. So those people who are screaming that Belarus people are weaklings, uh, go talk to Kalinovsky detachment. By the way, I had them on my channel, right? Regardless, to a certain degree, to a higher degree than uh, acceptable in my mind, this uh, point of view exists in our society and we are still working on differentiating the opinion that uh, Belarus people are not the Belarus regime. And, you know, they even have a legit president, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, who was elected, but she's in exile. Even she got something from our uh, internal squabbles. They mentioned her as a weakling and that she didn't fight enough, hard enough. Um, well, we, by the way, still haven't confirmed Lukashenko to be a legit president after those elections, uh, that he uh, obviously failed and she won more voices. But personally, I would say that I, would, I was always separating Belarus people from Belarus regime, and I still separate people of Russia from Putin's regime because people are people and cannibals are cannibals and these are very two different things and Belarus people remain brotherly nation to us they are occupied by Putin's regime as well and they are being treated in a similar fashion almost exactly as they treat people in Ukraine on occupied territories the only thing they don't have is uh, they don't have mass murder but they do have mass terror and Belarus government is doing that for Putin, so Putin doesn't need to do that. There is Lukashenko with his police. So when you're calling them for revolution, for revolt in Belarus, you're pretty much uh, calling uh, into the same situation as our people on the occupied territories. Don't think it's a country that uh, allows for such a behavior without dire consequence. Um, and even then, uh, these people managed to somehow break some of the railroads, uh, railroad lines, and during the early days of war, they forced the trains to take a longer route uh, that took them several more days to cross. And uh, that played a huge role in the early days of war when Russia had to go on a long detour instead of having direct access to the border. And I'm suspecting the effect of these actions will be analyzed later, but uh, it definitely had a huge effect on our capacity to defend Kiev. So once again, people in Belarus, they're in a similar position as our people on the occupied territories. You realize it's only specially prepared people who have government support that we give to our talented partisans but in Belarus, for us, this is an unsolvable task yet. And people have no resource to get this support from anywhere. So taking a blanket approach, all Belarus people are bad, is a wrong stance in this case. You just don't paint them all with big brush. This is wrong, and as long as I have a pulpit to talk to people from, um, I do. I will re-emphasize that lawfully elected president is one thing, normal citizens are one thing, and occupational regime and Lukashenko's regime are hold to other things. So, as much as I can, I will continue pouring water onto that problem, trying to fix uh, that opinion. We'll see how it goes. We have not as uh, money as yesterday, but we're getting to 400,000 and 150,000 people click the like button. Once again, um, 
this video is not advertised and our channel is not advertised in any manner it's your like buttons that help to promote it if you are watching that in english situation is exactly the same if you want more people to see that do not forget to click the like button this is the only tool to promote the channel and uh, share links uh, in those groups and those uh, under those news articles that you read when you see the news differ from what is actually happening on the ground or uh, if they're spinning something um, and continue subscribing oh, we mark's channel is reaching 1.8 million uh, our channel is much uh, smaller we're at 12,000 on the privateer station but please continue subscribing that also helps to promote it and subscribe to Alexei Nikolaevich's channel uh, he'd appreciate that as well today there was an interesting event we wanted to dedicate a whole stream tomorrow with some of other guests by the way we do have a stream tomorrow Alexei right yes yes we do okay G7 I'm uh, calling a stream with Gutkov and Pienkowski G8 tomorrow the great eight Russia out of this eight is gone and instead of them it's Zelensky maybe not the whole Ukraine as a country but Zelensky does look very organic in that group and I think now in Kremlin there is a scream of hatred and there are probably darts flowing, flow, flying into the screen and you and me somewhere deep in the depths of Kremlin because they probably feel it not being part of the collective powerhouse and having to see now Zelensky on their seat over there but I think it's a good situation so first of all he suggested to bring peacekeepers to the border between uh, to the border with Belarus and of course neither Russia nor Belarus would agree to that but do you think his appeals may have some results how about you just give me these suggestions and I'll try to comment on them because I had a crazy day I let's do it piecemeal okay so one suggestion was to bring peacekeepers to the border between Ukraine and Belarus he said we're not going to attack anything anywhere and this is all bullshit what uh, they're saying oh yeah because he does want uh, our peacekeepers to fixate uh, and record the lack of aggressive intentions on our side because we are being constantly accused by Belarus and things we don't do and they obviously Belarus is trying to create a cause for possible conflict while in reality this cause is not existent and Belarus attempt to create his uh, joint group of troops with Russia started with him accusing B Ukraine of uh, gathering troops on his border also as a result of yesterday missile strikes they're talking about weapon supplies yes our conversations with Biden confirmed that we'll get new air defense systems which ones what will be there there are not too many anti-air defense things in the united states it could either be patriot in different modifications or a smaller one of the archer type i think that's uh, humvee based or uh, avenger maybe i uh, sorry it's an evening and i'm very tired mark i start mixing names I think Avenger all right so he did ask for air defense systems and uh, also we saw that Iris T were delivered yeah Germany said uh, they delivered the first complex out of four scheduled is it on the territory of Ukraine and they said they delivered that to Ukraine and that means that Ukraine signed the acceptance uh, papers so we don't know if it is on the territory itself yet but uh, sooner or later it will sure be here and uh, for sure we'll be shooting targets out of the sky and there'll be four of them eventually how much effect can they have one complex can definitely 
fortify or increase the air defense capability of a city. So one complex can defend one city. Well, probably not fully defend, but definitely strengthen. How many cities? So Kiev, Kharkov, Dnieper, Zaporozhye, as an as, a, as an option, could be covered with these. All right, all right. But it's another question here. What do you protect? Do you protect cities or do you protect critical infrastructure elements? Uh, or, you know, you need more air defense systems to cover the skies. Because today, for example, we showed really high rates. We shot over 60% out of the sky, according to some data, even more than 60 but it's just the lack of the systems. For example, you have 10 systems and you have 30 targets flying in. What are you going to do? So it is a very actual problem for us. We need as many systems as we can get our hands on. Um, of course, there are some that are of, of a patriot type. They can solve these uh, situations much more effectively, even with smaller numbers. So it depends upon what uh, we'll be getting. If Patriots, that does change a lot of rules uh, in the favor of defense and safety of our cities and defending the critical infrastructure objects. They are much uh, higher quality than S-300s, than whatever Russians are using. It is reported that on that video connection of the G7 meeting, Ukraine president refused and reiterated his refusal to do any negotiations with Putin. Yes, our president is angry with Putin and he is very systematic. He not only refused to do it himself, he also fortified that decision with the Defense Council in Ukraine. So, you think the chances that he will not be talking on G20 in November with Putin as well? Well, Lavrov was trying to command that today, and he was saying that, well, what's the word? You give the word, you take the word, you're the master of your word. Right? That's going to be another mistake in their judgment of Zelensky character that they'll pay for dearly. They've already made these mistakes before. And each time they pay dearly for that mistake. All right, we've been live for about 32 minutes. We started discussing yesterday Erdogan's initiative. I think uh, he was asked by Putin. You mean, yeah, Putin wants to negotiate with the West. Since Zelensky would not talk to him, Putin wants to talk to the West. Do you think in the light of everything happening with G7 and everything, how probable is uh, such an outcome that Putin has some chance with the West, some negotiation with the West? Well, if he is not a complete idiot, I would uh, do as follows. If I cannot talk about the territories and the end of war. I would talk about the rules of war. For example, if he wants to continue, I would give a guarantee that I would not be using nuclear weapons and hold my word. Could have said, uh, all right, since there is nothing we can agree upon, I'll continue reaching my, trying to achieve my goals, but at least I'll promise you that I'm not going to put civilization on the brink of nuclear catastrophe. I'll be using conventional means and methods to obtain my goals. And then he probably could have negotiated something about their grain to alleviate some elements of world hunger and try to deal with uh, on the civilized side of things. But looking at this idiot, uh, he indeed continues to push his agenda. He wants to be a flying leader to the very end. And that's sort of understandable, because the war right now has no results that can be sold to Russian public. Um, and if that continues, uh, his destiny, his political destiny is sealed. Uh, he's going to be dead politically, and in Russia it very often translates into being dead physically. And uh, one would think they could have been satisfied with Lugansk and Donetsk regions, but they're idiots. They added Kherson and Zaporozhye to that. And they 
got uh, his own ways to retreat from it, to discuss and negotiate. And now he needs to smear and spread his uh, limited resources throughout four regions. If he would be concentrating everything on Lugansk and Donetsk, he had much higher chances of keeping them or keeping part of them. But uh, now that he has to hold four, this is a much weaker proposition for him to succeed. So, you know, war rules have been written out about 300 years ago and Russia is trying to destroy them everywhere they fight. So, I don't know, at the very least he could have discussed the rules of engagement and he could have guaranteed, you know, the, that nobody will continue this war later after or if there is a strategic pause in it, but nobody is going to believe him that, again, because he did promise that earlier with Crimea and other annexations. Because the West is cynical too and they know what, uh, who is Putin now. Erdogan is just milking him, he is smart and he is just using him to prop his position in the region. And the West is also rather smart. Our people are attacking the West and saying, well, you should have been supplying us more weapons. Um, let's put that aside. Uh, they do what they do, but the main attack was that the West would choose comfort over values. And this is not true. They have chosen values and they've showed that this year. This is obvious. They do not accept what Putin is doing in any version, in the version of Bucha, referendum, or missile strikes on the civil infrastructure, or energy supplies, blackmail. None of these uh, steps uh, guarantee Putin's survival, and he's basically politically is a corpse. But uh, there is a bigger picture, of course, and the Western politicians have to consider internal situation in their countries and their capabilities to support uh, us. So I don't know what they can talk to with Putin about. Uh, perhaps some guarantees about not using nuclear arms, but, you know, the statements we see leaking from the West also different. You know, all these little slips of the ex-bureaucrats, uh, so to say, um, are the slips that are very often authorized to happen and things they cannot say publicly, but they can say through the talking heads. And like Bolton mentioned that Putin is becoming a legit target, Putin himself. And um, others are saying that the consequences of any use of tactical nuke or anything will have the most dire consequences for Putin's army in Ukraine. So we understand that. We, we don't care. Ukraine people don't care even about Putin's nukes at this point. We understand that's mostly a bluff. And uh, the war, if he uses any of that, the war would be won much shorter, on much shorter time frame. And if he was hoping with his missile strikes to put us on the knees and start begging for peace, they haven't found a single man, a single person asking for that in the last two days of shelling. So the reaction was complete opposite. We are angry. And uh, politicians are stating that, okay, you can continue doing that, but you will be the target, Mr. Putin. You will be the target for retaliation. And if you start using nukes, uh, you are the target. You are the first and most important target. And, you know, we don't know the full capacity of the West in Putin's regime. Could have been that one of his bodyguards will finish him off and become a billionaire overnight. Or maybe, you know, some of his close friends will come in the morning and say, Vlad, you are no more, take your things and go. Um, so we'll see, we'll see how it unfolds. But uh, nobody knows the number of agents with real influence or people who can do uh, decisive action in Putin's vicinity if he decides to use any sort of nuclear weapon. And uh, they could be even competing amongst each other to see who gets him first. So he may be awaiting a bunch of surprises that usually end in the same fashion for a dictator, just like for Stalin back in the day. Um, yeah, one thing is to trade for the warning. Another is to get paid, get payback. Yeah, paybacks, uh, paybacks are coming. We need to be much more practical. 
because people need to be more practical if they want to survive and uh, also you know with Putin's uh, allies and friends if they want to have a better future they would need to deliver they would need to come through almost 530,000 watching us about a third click the like button Oh, Nova Kachovka just telling, texting me that there is a good shelling and uh, everything is blowing up. So they hit some uh, collection of equipment. Yeah, I didn't even mention there was Shepetovka, there was something happened on the territory of Russian Federation. Uh, oh yeah, there is a uh, oil refinery there, and as uh, yeah, Russian commentators mentioned, they are attacking holy objects of Russia, the alcohol produ producing factory. Um, Elon Musk had an interesting continuation today. Did you have time to follow? No, I didn't. Uh, what happened? Suddenly, Ian Bremer, his uh, rather authoritative person, well known, um, who posted and said that Musk told me that he talked to Putin directly and that series of tweets is influenced uh, by his conversation with Putin, who supposedly told Musk that, what do I want? I want Crimea to be Russian and I want for regions to be Russian. And uh, I want a new neutral status for Ukraine and no NATO. And that uh, would uh, keep the world peace. Yeah, exactly, right? And if they will continue attacking us and if they will go into Crimea, I will drop a nuke on them. Musk got so impressed and posted that on Twitter. Musk uh, refuted that, said, uh, last time I talked to Putin was 18 months ago and we talked about space. Yeah, right, that, that, that music from 17 moments of spring, a uh, classic Soviet movie in the, the 20th century about the Second World War. So yeah, you know, in situations with Musk, um, Things are 50-50. Now they're indeed uh, ferried Kikina to the space station on his Dragon, on Dragon 5, just about a week ago. So he could have had a chance to talk to Putin because since she flown with him, perhaps, perhaps he had a chance to converse with Putin. I don't know. Well, Musk refuted. Musk said, this is not true. But what is interesting here is that whatever is voiced is the plan that Putin is uh, offering or pushing through different media channels and his uh, pocket talking heads. And I started digging, I started checking uh, on Peterson, Jordan Peterson. Do you know, by the way, they're indeed friends, uh, that they have direct link to each other, they, they talk. Peterson and Musk. And by the way, yeah, Peterson also talked, uh, remember, about Ukraine. He was saying maybe stop, maybe enough running with Ukraine, maybe just sit down and negotiate. And I voiced that uh, in different interviews I had with Ukrainian media and others. It is interesting that Musk is uh, sort of afraid of possible nuclear resolution to this uh, conflict, that he will not have enough time to start uh, his Martian colony. And he may be th uh, thinking about, you know, other goals, so probably he is uh, offering a plan because, you know, Crimea and four districts, big deal, we're going to settle another planet, you guys, you know, just tighten your belts, give that. So in order to talk about that in detail, somebody needs to tell him that in detail. And of course, the main Satanist who is uh, trying to hit the planet now and drag it into the conflict somewhere is Putin. You know, I have a feeling that, and I mentioned that, that Musk is a simulacrum of progress, Peterson is a simulacrum of philosophy, and Pope is a simulacrum of faith. And there will be people who will be defending them and saying that 
they represent progress, philosophy, and faith, indeed, but I would say they were interesting figures, of course, human figures, so without, not without any issues, but now, after all of them came out with the proposition to negotiate with a cannibal who created, you know, dozens of butchers in our country, I appreciate the input they uh, and the things they brought to our civilization and their influence, but, and I can separate engineer from his political views, for example, but uh, on the ethical front, these people stopped existing for me because you cannot treat uh, ethical and moral component. So you, you, you can, if you're neglecting it to that degree with these propositions, that uh, puts a long shadow on you. So for me, they're somewhat in empty suits right now. You know, I had a chance to talk to Musk and visit his factory and his place. There were interesting things planned. I can, you know, if uh, there'd be a chance, I can talk to him as a psychotherapist. But over, overall, from that point of view, I only see people, I don't care about their, you know, political caliber or nationality or anything. And I can gauge his achievements in one way, but uh, gauging his persona, yeah, I, I see certain issues there. And I understand that Putin is looking for different ways to drop the card uh, of agreement, the, that strategy of let's sit down and agree. This is not even a secret, and Belarus as well. They're looking for all angles here to force the negotiations with us, but they won't find them because we are the ones deciding if we want to negotiate or not. And the West will not accept that either because they'll never put themselves into a situation where they're forcing us to negotiate, uh, otherwise they'll stop supplying weapons. This will not happen because otherwise it'll be a catastrophe for everything on the West. That means everybody in the world, including China, would understand that if you attack Western interests and then threaten with nukes, then the West would what? Retreat? And then the next question is, where's the limit? Today you want four districts, four regions, then you have six, eight, then you want Baltic countries, you want Poland, each time threatening with a nuke. China may want Taiwan, a piece of India, and something else, and again threaten with a nuke. And then there is a question, okay, so when do you stop that? And the answer is very simple. You need to stop these things immediately, at the very beginning, because later it comes at much higher cost. And they do understand that on the West, that you do need to stop these cannibals at the first step. And an answer to his pleadings, leave me four regions, the West responds with uh, the mouths of uh, four of their officials and unofficial, uh, retired officials, Putin, you're a goner. You're a goner and your goals are crazy. I applaud Erdogan, though, he's milking the situation to his advantage. He, the desperation with which Putin, Putin is looking to find nego negotiation platforms are very well in line with information we're getting from Russia about their economic and military catastrophes. For example, military, they have airplanes, but uh, they don't have prepared pilots to fly them. And the problems are snowballing. Very soon they'll likely break the back of this regime and Russia will lose completely on the battlefront and that's why they're scrambling. They're still pushing, finding ways, uh, looking for ways to keep what they achieved because they understand everything will be lost. And everybody in the West understood that. So even, you know, the last cat in the United Nations understands that they are in the weak position. 
on the brink if they're begging and ready to do anything. That means that the future use of force from that weak position, including nuclear weapons, looks very controversial. Uh, looks very unlikely. And that means, you know, Erdogan sees that and he understands that and he is continuing to milk Putin for more resources or advantages he can gain. And then after all that is gone, he'll probably throw him away like a used condom. Goodbye, Mr. Putin. All right, we've been almost 15 minutes live. At the end of this stream, we want to share another piece of news with you. Yesterday, a doctor, Oksana Leontieva, died. She was a hematologist. She was curing cancer in a children's hospital. Ahmadit in Kiev. She died yesterday. Putin killed her and her little son. Gre Gregory is an orphan. His father died a year ago. He is five years old. And from our project, Fagin and Aristovich, we transferred 2000 euros to his relatives in Khrivnas. I'm not exactly sure the exchange rate. But uh, yeah, we tried to support uh, this young fellow and we also transferred some money to one of the Azov people who was liberated, who was released and exchanged from Russian prison. By the way, there was another exchange today. We rescued more. I saw that, yeah. And uh, yeah, we helped to Alexander Radales. I think he was a policeman, was also exchange as a result of Azov uh, fighters exchange. This is our little help to these guys whom we can. More stories of human tragedies. Sorry to, for interrupting you, Mark. It's good that we did. This is, by the way, the chart. I, was, I posted that today, the chart of missile and uh, strikes compared the first day of war with the yesterday. First day 160, yesterday 84 in three volleys. And they were hitting infrastructure objects since the beginning. Second, this operation like yesterday could not be prepared in a couple of days after the explosion of Crimean Bridge. It means that Putin indeed planned uh, rising the intensity of this conflict in advance and um, it needs to be understood and Kuleba explained that to the Western media who decided to say that this is a response to the bridge. What response? These idiots started the war eight years ago and there are no responses, there is just expansion of aggression. We are responding, they're just expanding the aggression and uh, increasing the escalation. Yeah, we are showing the table now uh, on the screen and those people who want to, they can uh, take a screenshot and see that or go to your social. We had uh, 530, 540,000 people. Uh, please, uh, 200,000 click the like button. Do not forget to click the like button before you go. And it is important for us. Uh, please also subscribe. This is just as important to keep promoting it. And uh, see you tomorrow at 10, right? You're good? Yeah, yeah, all's good. All right, then we'll see you tomorrow. And whatever we did not talk about today, we'll do that tomorrow. Goodbye, everybody. See you.